we all come to this place and we have a journey behind us. Some of you have more days walked than I do, more days lived. Now, and uh, if we were to get some time together and we were to provide an opportunity for each person joining us today to share some of their highlight moments, their pivotal moments. If you think about it, not every day is equal to the next when we think about the journey of our lives, right? You can think back and there's a lot of days that just blend into the nothingness. They, they just blend into the, the sweeping waves of history, washed away like sand, a sand castle that gets washed by the waves, right? Where you're just like, oh, I think something happened, but I don't know. But then there's those other days that stay with you because, again, they're pivotal moments in your life. They, maybe they mark a new direction. Maybe you started a new job and it sets you on a course. And you're like, yeah, I remember the day I started that job. It marked the next 25 years of my life. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe you can think back to the day where you first met that special someone and it was like the stars aligned. Right? A pivotal moment where life would never be the same. Maybe it was the wedding day. Maybe it was uh, on the tragic side, right? Maybe there's pivotal moments that have marked your journey from a negative perspective where you go back and you can experience the trauma again. We all have these moments that come to mark us, right? We have these moments that come to mark us. When you talk to people who... Uh, end up in ministry. There, there's sometimes uh, conversations around the call, right? The call to ministry. And I got to say, whenever anyone asks me about my call to ministry, I have to be honest. And that I say, I have actually never had a road to Damascus experience, right? This time when the sky opened and a voice told me what I was going to do. I've never had that. I've never had that. When you think about that language that marks, say, a pivotal moment, like someone choosing to orient their life to ministry, you sometimes wonder, how does someone know what to do? How does someone make the decision to make this giant pivotal shift in their life to commit to a path that will result in whatever may come? Well, it's actually a very unique process right? How decisions are made for each of us. We can go back to all of those pivotal moments and they're probably all very different. But when we use language like road to Damascus experience, we're actually referencing the story we're looking at today. The story we're looking at today, where Saul had a divine encounter and his life was never the same again. As he would recount his life, he'd return to the moment we're looking at today, and he'd say, yep, God met me, and I was never the same again. For you, again, when you were thinking about some of your pivotal moments, maybe you had road to Damascus experiences. Maybe you've heard God, or you've felt God, or you've been uh, encouraged in certain directions, and they have forever changed your life. Maybe you're waiting for God to interact with you. Maybe you're like, man, I really wish I experienced God in this area of my life because I think then I'd be able to cope a little bit better or then I'd have a little bit more direction or fill in the blank. Well, friends, today, again, as we're working through Acts, one of the pivotal things that we've seen and we will see once again is that the movement from beginning to finish and all the way through on every page is marked by the movement of the Spirit, marked by Jesus' interaction as the one who is risen and reigning on the throne. If you remember back at the beginning, Jesus told his disciples to hang out in Jerusalem and that uh, the, the Spirit would come and provide the power to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost points of the earth. Last week we saw as the Ethiopian eunuch received uh, salvation, was baptized, that we saw that gospel message pushing then to the outermost parts of the earth, all motivated by the Spirit, all Jesus doing work in the lives of people to be his hands and feet as the gospel went out. Beautiful, beautiful. And again, if you remember, we're trying to figure out what do these early stories 
tell us about being the church in this time and in this place. So be thinking about that as we take a look at this story this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and we're just going to be hanging out here for the next few minutes. Acts chapter 9, and it starts out and it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So if you're working through the text, we have left uh, Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch, right? Where... The Philip was taken to somewhere else, and he started preaching there. The uh, Ethiopian continued on his way back, rejoicing. And meanwhile, you got to think like it's like a camera switch. Meanwhile, as this is happening, as God's working over here in these lives, meanwhile, Saul is still persecuting the church, still ravenously against the movement of the way followers of Jesus that were bubbling at that time and place. And he was uttering these, again, murderous threats. As uh, the Christians scattered out of Jerusalem at the persecution of Saul, and again, they would have ran wondering, will persecution ripple out to wherever we find? Can we go far enough that persecution won't reach us? Well, friends, their fears were well rooted because here we have Saul continuing his persecution. And so he goes to the high priest. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So Saul had no authority on his own. He was just a guy who was passionately about Yahweh, about his Jewish rhythms. And so he went to the high priest and said, give me authority. Give me your authority to go and act on your behalf to stamp out the way up in Damascus. And he received the letters. Now, it's interesting to trace the power here. Saul having none, going to the high priest who had power. Now, the role of the high priest is a little bit complicated at this time because obviously he had power as uh, the high priest in his position. So among the Israelites, he would have had power. Control, authority. And so, again, Paul going for, Saul going for those letters. However, if you think about it, at this time, Israel was an oppressed people group under the rule of Rome. And so how does the high priest have any power at all to make any decisions and arrest anyone at that time? Well, the high priest had made an unholy alliance. Right? The high priest had sworn fealty to Rome in order to maintain his power, privilege, and position. You think the high priest is there, and the high priest should be representing Yahweh and Yahweh well. And yet, when it came to push, you know, push and shove in the, the practical realities of first century Jerusalem, the high priest said, yeah, but there's an emperor on the throne, and I need to bend the knee to that emperor. So Paul, Saul, Saul received authority, got the letter from the high priest. Now, again, when we think about the complexity of the high priest at that time, you got to remember that the high priest had hopes for the restoration of Israel, right? It's not all negative. It wasn't all just You know, the high priest wanted Yahweh to come back in power and wanted Israel to be restored and all of the rest of that. The high priest held that, but but thought the best way to do that is to pay homage to the emperor. Again, practical realities bumping up against the what faithfulness to his God would have called him to. So it continues. So again, the high priest gives letters. so that if Saul found any there in Damascus who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now, verse 3 says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Now, Saul responds, and he says, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting, he replied. Friends, do you see, again, this 
divine encounter. So when I say, regarding my call to ministry, that I never had a road to Damascus experience. I never had a time where I was knocked off my course, that I had set a course and said, I'm heading that direction, come what may, and on my way down there, I said, hold up, no, you're not, you're going to go somewhere else. I have something else for you. I never had that. There was whispers and proddings and voices speaking in my life. And I think God used a lot of other factors. God still spoke, but it was different, right? It was different. Heaven wasn't rent open and a voice calling out, startling me, blinding me, forcing me to reflect on all that's gone on. I never had that. It was different. So, but you got to see that there's times where God rips open our experience in order to speak. There's times where God says, hold up. I got something to say. Friends, may we have ears to hear. May we have ears to hear. How is God speaking to you in these days? I find that during the pandemic, I could use a little bit more of the skies opening, the light shining down, and the clear instruction because really at times I find that the moments day by day are a little bit more foggy. It's a little easier to get into, you know, uh, just different rhythms. And it's like, God, would you speak? There's times where God opens the heavens and speaks and calls people. And there's times where God uses the still small voice. Where God uses the people around us to speak to us. Where God sure does something, but it's in different ways. So he calls out to Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul says, who are you, Lord? And I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Do, do you see that Jesus associates himself with the church? Jesus associates himself with those who are being persecuted. So as Saul has gone about his business, he, ne he wasn't involved in actually persecuting Jesus arresting Jesus, taking Jesus to the cross. But as Saul has been persecuting the church, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Friends, there is a beauty to what we see going on here where God in Jesus associates with the church. God, king of kings, who is on the throne, pulls in that association with people that are running for their lives, scared. We could fast forward and say, friends, Jesus associates with us. We are living our lives, we have our stories, and yet in a beautiful way, Jesus says, yes, and they are my body. They are my body. This should give us a, just a, a little bit of reminder that God is for us and God is here to move among us and be a part of what we're doing. We don't do it on our own. It's not just our hands. We pray that the Holy Spirit works in us, this divine association. Now, do you see how, in, in some respects, this is juxtaposed to the other authorities we see in the story. So Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? King of kings, Lord of lords, all power in heaven and on earth now rests in Christ. And he is being persecuted through the church being persecuted. What are the other authority figures we see in the story? Well, we see the high priest. The high priest cowering in the temple from the powers of Rome, clinging to power and prestige, even though his people, the rest of the Israelites, are also oppressed under Rome interesting. And then you go to the Roman Empire, emperor. And obviously there's lots of different emperors with lots of different stories, but in general the emperor was a little full of themselves. They actually came to view themselves as a child of the gods. Right? They thought they were worthy of people coming and bowing before them. And they thought they deserved 
all of the money that came in and the taxes and everything. They thought they deserved to go out and conquer different peoples so that they could expand their empire. They thought it was their divine right and their prerogative to do that. How juxtaposed is that mentality? I have every right to go and do what I want, earn what I want, oppress what I want, expand my empire versus the one, the king of kings, who associates with those who are persecuted. Why are you persecuting me? In Jesus, we see authority like no other. Right? The message of the cross is one where the kingdom gets turned upside down and the one who rightfully has all authority and rightfully should be on the throne who we can bow to is the one that actually says, you're persecuting me. It's similar, if you remember, near... Uh, in Matthew 25, we have a re recording of Jesus teaching. And there we see more unlikely association, right? In Matthew 25, Jesus is teaching and he speaks of what's going to happen when the Son of Man returns. And he talks about the separation of the sheep and the goats. Right. And in that, this association, we see, uh, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Not just those who are persecuted for Jesus' name. Jesus associates with the least of these. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. You did for me. Friends, do you see what we have going on in this? We have a God who associates with the bottom barrel, with the outcasts, with those who are sick, those who are imprisoned. A God who associates and says, whatever you've done for them, you've done for me. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I think sometimes we, we think that we're worshiping a God who stands far off. And yet, friends, in Jesus, the message of Christ is that we have a God who comes close to the lowly, comes close to mere mortals, comes close to all who are weary and heavy laden, and comes to give us rest. The message of the gospel is of, yes, the king. Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is risen. That's the gospel. The good news is that Caesar isn't, isn't the final authority. And those broken temple systems where you have religious leaders, again, clawing for their power, prestige, and position aren't the final story because in it we have Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Unlikely association. Jesus and the least of these. Well, Saul hears this and he, we see him actually listen to this voice. In verse 6, the, Jesus says, Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. Now get up and go into the city. It, again, here is one just a few moments prior, was almost at his Damascus destination. So fiery, so passionate, so uh, sure of his mission that he traveled almost 225 kilometers. It would have taken him almost two weeks to go from Jerusalem. And in a moment, meeting Jesus, knocked on his butt, hearing a voice, why are you persecuting me? He now changes his direction. Yes, he's still going to Damascus, not geographic direction, but who he's now listening to and who he's now living for. The voice tells him to go into Damascus. Go into the city and you will be told what, you to, what to do. And Saul goes. He needs to be led there by the men that he's traveling with. Verse 7 says, The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Here's another reminder about God working in unique lives and unique ways and unique circumstances. Right? Paul was called in this way. We don't need to listen for the skies to open and light to shine. I expressed how I was called a little bit differently, very differently, in fact. Yet I still feel I was called. 
you may be invited into different rhythms of serving God that may not look like the other rhythms, the other invitations, right? So we can't just try to echo our lives after someone else's life. Well, God did that in them. I got to wait for God to do that in me. Well, friends, maybe God's doing something else in you. Maybe God is carving out a new niche for you. Maybe God is calling you to go into a different place or to do something else. Can we be faithful to what God calls us to? So these men didn't see Jesus. They just heard. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. He was blinded. So the men took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. Right? He obeyed. He listened. And then for three days, he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Try to get into Paul's, Saul's headspace here. I'm going to mess that up all day, I think. But try to get into Saul's headspace in this moment. Right? He had, again, lived his life passionately devoted, pursuing Yahweh. And when the church started to gain momentum, he said, oh no, not on my watch. And he started persecuting, right? And we saw that he stood behind Stephen being stoned. And we saw that the great persecution that broke out in Jerusalem at that time that pushed people away was driven by Saul. He was passionate. And, and a few weeks ago, we quoted how he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, right? Paul, Saul was just uh, passionately about what he thought to be true. And then now here in this moment, after this divine encounter, I think he's doing some thinking. I think he's wrestling internally, right? Thinking through all that he had done, all that he experienced. Where was I wrong? What is the truth? Where's the firm foundation that I can stand? I thought I knew it. I thought I knew it. And for three days, he doesn't eat a thing. He fasts, he prays, he pursues God, and he tries to figure things out. In verse 10, the scene shifts. So we leave Saul, fasting, blind in the building, and the scene shifts to another character. Verse 10 says, In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Now, we get introduced to it says a disciple. He was the very ones, one of the very ones that Saul was coming to try to arrest. So you have to think again, it would have taken two weeks for Saul and his band of enforcers to make their way from Jerusalem up to Damascus. And so for two weeks, perhaps a messenger ran ahead. Hey guys, he's coming. Get ready. You got to run. Saul is coming. And so Ananias was still in the city. So obviously he kind of said, okay, come what may, I am going to serve God here. He had been preparing himself to be dragged out of his home, to be arrested and brought back to Jerusalem for trial. He had heard of Saul. He knew it was coming. He had been readying himself. And so the Lord calls him. Ananias. And you got to think, right? When, when your quiet time or your breakfast or you just sweeping the floor gets interrupted with your name being called by God, you got to think, oh boy, oh boy, he's got something big for me, right? Oh boy, this is going to be good. Ananias, Ananias says, yes, Lord, I'm here. I'm ready. Verse 11 says, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Hold up, God. Saul of Tarsus? I've heard what he does. I've been getting ready for his arrival. I've been preparing myself. You want me to go see him? He says, verse 13, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. 
hold up, God, really? This is why you called me? This is why you interrupted my day? Do you see that he highlights the authority piece? He comes with the authority of the high priest. And again, in that setting, we've got to remember that the high priest only has authority because of bending a knee to the Roman Empire emperor. So he's coming with the power of actually Rome. Now the response. The Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You got to go because I'm going to use him. I'm going to use him. And do you see that already in this brief moment, we, it cracks open to a lesson about authority in the kingdom of heaven where Ananias says, he comes with authority. And yet the, here, uh, the response is, this man is my instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings. This guy is going to show them a real lesson in authority in my name. Saul's going to go turn the world upside down, declare the gospel, and he will be harmed on my account. The one who did so much harm will be harmed on my account. I think this is, again, a beautiful note here where uh, there can be expectations around where true power lies. There can be practical realities, and we can sometimes be scared about what it means to follow Jesus. More so in other countries, where actually believing faith, you risk your freedom. You sometimes risk your very life, and yet people still do it because they have met the risen Christ and they have found him compelling. Friends, what would it mean for us to recognize true authority? Authority to move through our days with a trust, with a faithfulness, to be able to go where we are called, to be able to follow where we're led, to be able to speak when occasion arises to represent the risen Christ, the King of kings, Lord of lords, who associates with the least of these. So in this, we have a lesson in true authority, and we have a declaration of truth against that dominant power. Now, friends, do remember some of what we've seen already. When you stand against the dominant power, you must be ready for that dominant power to push back. There's always repercussions to stand against the dominant power. And again, it's highlighted as Saul goes out and shares the truth of my name, he will stand against the dominant power and the dominant power would push back. He will suffer for my name. He will suffer for my name. Ananias went up to the house and entered it. Picture it. Saul fasting, blind, praying, trying to figure things out. Ananias carefully making his way up, unsure what he's getting into. And yet we're going to see in the next few words a softness, an intimacy that Ananias brings. I think, again, when we think about the power the Holy Spirit brings in order for people to be witnesses for what Christ is up to and the kingdom of Christ coming, breaking into this world, there's power to knock people off their donkeys on their way into Damascus, light up the light, but there's also power to be soft in these moments of tenderness. Catch this. So in verse 17, Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. So you think a blind man who's newly blind, right? Newly blind. So you got to think like any sounds that are going on around him, Saul would be like, wait, what's that? Who's that? Right? A little unsure of the space. This isn't his house. So getting to the chair, he's got to feel his way along, getting to the bed, getting to eat, trying to make sure that he, what, what am I, the experience of being blind would have been disorienting. So Ananias comes in and he places his hand on Saul. Did Saul, did, did Saul jump? Wait, who are you? And he says, brother, brother Saul, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
right? Just in that, that tender moment of placing his hands on him and speaking, brother, brother Saul. There's an acceptance and an invitation and a tender moment there that, again, would have, again, I think surrounded Saul with uh, the warmth of the Holy Spirit in that moment. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. I, I think it's funny how this, uh, these statements of faithfulness after his conversion, after he gets prayed for, are, are just like, almost like footnotes to the whole story, right? He could see again, he got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So again, he some baptism stories are big and massive moments, but for, for Saul, it was like, yeah, I, I'm going to be baptized and then move on. It's just kind of a, a beautiful thing because God had already spoke to him. He had been wrestling with, what is God up to in my life for three days? Then he meets Ananias. Brother Saul, you are accepted. You're part of the family. Prays for him. Holy Spirit fills him. Eats. Because now he has the clarity, right? He ends his fast. He regained his strength. Now, Saul was still that zealous man, that passionate man, right? That fiery man who was persecuting. But when he was yanked off his own path and pulled onto the path of Christ, all that passion and fire and who he was actually got turned to the way of Christ and the mission of Christ, the text continues, Saul, Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in all the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. At once he began. At once he began. As soon as he gained the clarity that Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus was the fulfillment of Old Testament. He had spent his life studying the Old Testament. He had spent his life pursuing God through the law. Right? And he was faultless. And he had zealously persecuted this divergent group of, of, of Jews who called themselves the way, who were trying to follow Jesus. But when Jesus met him and redirected his life, all that passion, excitement, seal got poured out for the mission of Christ in the world. Friends, when Christ calls us, he uses who we are. Right? Yes, we're changed. Yes, we're transformed. But that new direction we go, we think of the passion, the skill set, the who we are doesn't change. But we are made new in Christ. Gives it giving us a new path, a new mission, a new way to be in the world. Now, friends, as we kind of reflect on this story, there is so much beauty here. And again, first and foremost, as we go, may we remember God's the God of unlikely association that even us, God invites us to be his family, to be his hands and feet, to be his body. There's an association. And then when we think out to God associating with the least of these, Jesus saying, whatever you have done to the least of these, you have done to me. There is a challenge to us who hear this and say, well, we want to we, we, we follow this. Christ who associates with the least of these. It serves a challenge for who we are, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, who we are in the world. I think again in the story, one to be yanked off his own path, someone like Saul, so passionately about the persecution of the church to meet Jesus and have his life radically changed. I think it serves as a, a reminder and a note of hope that no one is beyond God's grace. No one's beyond God's, God's grace. Maybe we're sitting here and we're saying, but you don't know me. You don't know that part of my story. And I got to say, you didn't get it. Well, I don't know. Even if you killed someone, you're not beyond God's grace. Right? No one's beyond God's grace. God's grace lifts up. God's grace meets the broken. God's grace is there for even the worst of the worst, and saying, actually, you can have a new life. There's beauty there. And then Ananias. We don't hear about Ananias again. 
This is his moment. Hearing again, preparing himself for persecution, thinking, I'm going to stand here, I'm not leaving. Go talk to Saul. Pray for him. Okay, yes, Lord. Faithfully goes and does that, but then we, he falls out of the story. So when we think about faithfully being a disciple of Jesus, it doesn't mean being in the limelight all, all the time. It means faithfully living day by day, just doing what we are called to in the moment. But when the call comes, disrupting the everyday, will we say yes? Ananias did so. And we actually get his name in scripture recorded. And there's a beauty there. And I, I hope that although my life, I just try to live day by day, I try to be a good dad, try to be a good husband, I try to be a good neighbor, try to be a good friend. And again, faithfulness in the day by day, not much of note. Not much of note that becomes a milestone moment in my life where I can say, hey, remember when? Remember I, when I cut my grass? Remember when I washed the dishes? Remember when I went and we had some technical issues at church, but church happened and some people gathered and we prayed, sang some songs and we did the thing, right? All of these little moments aren't those pivotal moments that we remember, but when that moment comes, if God disrupts my life and says, will you come, would I? I'd like to hope so. So there's value in the faithfulness of the everyday, but would we, there may come a time where like Ananias, each of us is called to change the direction and do the thing. Would you say yes? All of these swirling moments as we work our way through the book of Acts, the birth of the church, but the, a, a key thing to hold on to here, friends, is that we see that from the beginning of the story all the way to the end, we have Christ pushing the movement through the power of the Holy Spirit pulling people, calling people, changing people, right? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just pray that we as a church would be uh, tuned to the Holy Spirit working in us and around us. Let it be the Holy Spirit that energizes our ministry. That whether it be playing cards at a table downstairs, whether it be preaching a sermon from the stage, whether it be knitting a, a hat or baking some banana bread or uh, whatever it is, right? That we would have the Holy Spirit indwelling it so that these little moments of faithfulness would carve out space for God to do his thing in the world. Milestone moments, road to Damascus experiences, Still small voices calling us when we're eating, sweeping. Through it all, may we say yes. May we say yes. When God disrupts, when God meets us in the middle of the everyday, may we say yes to what he invites us into day by day. Let's just pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for each person here. I thank you for the stories that are represented in this place. Stories of pain, hardship, sorrow, stories of joy, of overcoming. And yet through it all, we have people showing up and saying, how about today? Lord Jesus, how do I serve you today? I just pray that you would meet us, speak to us, lead us, guide us, direct us, and that may today be just one more step on our discipleship journey. And every day may we say yes to the little acts of faithfulness that is involved in being a Christian. But when there comes a point where you disrupt our every day in order to say, hey, would you go to this guy who's been persecuting the church and lay your hands, pray for him, let him know. May we then say yes. Lord Jesus, have your way in this place, in this church family, and each of us as individuals. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.